Welcome to Barrows Duke Street. We're looking back at this important historical area to uncover the businesses which traded here on the street and the people who lived here and worked here throughout the years. Using historical research from Barrow archives and local people's memories will tell the story of the street. Before Barrow's development in the mid-19th century, Duke Street was an unmade road linking the villages of Barrow and Hindpool. By the 1870s, the busy street contained shops, banks and a hotel. But the muddy road was described as a dust bowl in summer and a quagmire in winter. The street as yet is not a great success. The carriageway is very far from good and the broad sidewalks oft present a mess in which a lady does not care to trail her dress. Duke Street was named in honour of the 7th Duke of Devonshire, one of the main backers of James Ramsden's vision of creating a thriving industrial town. At number 54 to 56 Duke Street stood Passing Corps, a purpose-built department store. It began as a small general hardware store at 100 Duke Street, owned by Robert Pass's grandmother Betsy in the 1870s. After Betsy's death, the family continued to build the business and plans were drawn up to build a much larger store opposite the Hartington Hotel. The new store opened in 1904. It was quite a, an iconic building, um, the first department store for Barrow in Furness and passes sold anything from a pin to a piano, which was the old adage. Walsh and Paul moved in to sell popular musical instruments. Pass and Core traded for nearly 60 years and is fondly remembered for its record department. And I remember buying uh, 78 records from them. We were going and order um, a record of some sort. They would order it for me, then or they would send a postcard sometimes. We'd go into Barrow perhaps four or five days later and go and collect it. And the youngsters used to come in and they had their list of the top 20 on the, on the wall and they used to pick a record and I used to put it on behind the counter and then they used to listen to it in the little booths. The store closed in 1962 and was followed by the Lotus Chinese restaurant and then Dandy's Bed Store. So we decided to start a business in Pass's old building, only in part of it, selling beds. We um, had many, many years in there, 20 years in that building. In 1999, the building became Yates's Wine Lodge. However, it was deemed structurally unsafe in 2013 and demolished the following year. Numbers 58 to 64 was the Hartington Hotel, built in 1864. This popular hotel was named in honour of William Cavendish, the 7th Duke of Devonshire and Marquis of Hartington. With large concert room, club rooms and retiring rooms and handsomely fitted up spirit vaults, brew house, stable and other outbuildings. The Hartington was built by Joseph Rawcliffe, who played a major role in the development of the town. He could be described as the forgotten man, as he is barely mentioned in any documented history. He died in 1886, aged just 58, and he is buried in an unmarked grave in Barrow Cemetery. Next door was Tuna and Denison's The Pawn Shop and a butcher's. Opposite was Jean's Wet Fish Shop and clean quick dry cleaners. The Hartington front door had a brass letterbox and door handles which shone and when you went in the front door the stairs in front of you had brass edges on the treads which my mother made sure were well polished. Today numbers 54 to 64 
are owned by a local businessman, Steve Johnson, as Jefferson Hotel and Apartment. Numbers 77 and 79 Duke Street are Grade 2 listed buildings and were built around 1865. The first recorded occupier was Joseph Richardson and the North Lonsdale Printing Company who printed the Vulcan newspaper. From 1875, Benjamin Wright, tailor and outfitter occupied the building. A handsome and striking display is made in all the chief lines dealt in. These may be said to comprise all the branches of ready-made clothing, hats, caps, hosiery, mercery, gloves, underclothing and general outfitting articles. In the early 1900s, Rayner and Ferguson tailors and outfitters traded here for over 30 years. In 1903, Mr Rayner was a passenger on the early morning mail train from Camford during a 100 mile an hour storm. He only survived being blown into the sea by crawling to safety with other passengers. Many will recall the youth employment service, but well, this shop is best remembered as a pram shop in the 1950s. It sold coach built silver cross and pedigree prams, cots, cribs, baby wear and toys. You could make a weekly or monthly payment using a club card and the selected pram would be put away until the baby arrived. In the early years, he also offered a doll's hospital service to men broken dolls. In 1871, 81 Duke Street was a grocery store owned by Alfred Lublin, who lived above the shop with his father, mother, sister, brother and a 14-year-old shop apprentice. The following year the shop was broken into and 11 hams, 16 flitches of bacon were stolen. A flitch is a side of bacon, half a pig. The thief was caught and sentenced to nine months imprisonment. Not long after, a painful occurrence at Barrow was reported in the paper. In a tragic accident, Alfred's father was crushed when a hogshead of sugar slipped while being carried down to the cellar. The verdict was an accidental death. By 1898, the shop had been purchased by Taylor's Drug Company. One item for sale was Stothus Pills, advertised to cure headaches, sickness, indigestion, flatulence, heartburn and bilious affections. From the 1950s to the 1970s, the shop was occupied by Sankeys, a local photographers. From around the mid-1890s until the mid-1960s, father and son Edward and Raymond Sankey captured photos of Barrow and the day-to-day -day lives of people in the town and the northwest. The Sankey's Photograph Archive contains around 15,000 collected images which are being archived by Signal Film and Media. Eighty six Duke Street was built around eighteen sixty, and the first recorded occupier was a pawnbroker, John Morris, and his family, who lived here in eighteen seventy one. He was a well-educated and highly respected man who held a prestigious position of Honorary Secretary of the Barrow Tradesmen Guild. However, in March 1874, John faced a criminal charge of shooting with intent to kill and murder. Mr Morris leaned out of his back bedroom window and fired two shots at two men near his back door. He then went downstairs, confronted the two men and shot one in the chest. Fortunately, it was only a flesh wound. John was found not guilty and claimed that he'd armed himself to defend his business after the spates of local burglaries. By the early 1920s, Middleton Court's hairdressers was owned by Arthur and Winifred Middleton. 
It's been said that up to 80 hairdressers work from the premises. The House of Middleton is one of the finest appointed hairdressing establishments in the county. The impression conveyed on entering their premises is one of quiet luxury and refinement, and yet, with all that, a smooth efficiency pervades everywhere. All hairstyles are created to suit the individual, and every client is under the personal supervision of Mr Middleton himself. Arthur and Winifred's daughter Elizabeth, known as Betty, carried on the business until she retired in 1997, and Betty died in January 2020, aged 99 years. In 2008, Paul Rose opened High Flyers Cafe, had an aviation theme and the cockpit of a commuter aircraft in the window. In 2018, Dave Turner opened TNT Records, a proper record shop on Duke Street. And when this came along, we thought, oh, Duke Street, oh, brilliant. Big open spaces, nice big roads, nice beautiful buildings, solid walls, three storeys high. Yeah, let's go look at it. So we come down within 10 minutes of seeing the property. We fell in love with it. We, we opened within six days of having the keys on the 22nd of December 2018, three days before Christmas. We took a risk, but it, was, it paid off. Ever since day one, it's paid off. We were actually looking in the basement not so long back and we found um, like a really old uh, Sweeney Todd looking quirky um, barber's chair. Um, it was really dirty and a little bit rusty, but, but wow, what a, what a really good piece of art, to be honest with you. Uh, and history, obviously, of the building. Uh, it's been there for decades, I'm sure it has. And there's no way you can get it out of, you, you would literally have to cut the floor to take it out as well. It's an absolute honour to come to work every day on Duke Street. The Pridey Hairdressers now occupies number 87. However, the shop front has changed very little since John Bolton opened his Iron Mongers store here in the late 1860s. In 1905, William Robinson and Son opened the County Auction Rooms. On the current property, we can see the original large bay window, which would display items prominently on the street front to potential bidders. It was quite exciting, actually, when I was really very young. Cause, you know, people would be bidding on things and they'd be putting their hands up and then the, the gavel would go down. And So it's a really, really proper old-fashioned auction room. So they'd be, they'd be all stood at, you know, back with their arms crossed and the, the caps on and then they'd be just, just wagging a finger rather than, you know, holding their hands up so they could be bidding on the quiet, if you will. But you had to be absolutely you know, silent when that was on because, uh, you know, nod or scratch your nose, you know, we'll end up buying something. <laughs> the Robinsons auction room didn't only sell furniture and property, they acted as emigration agents selling passage abroad. During the 1920s and 30s, many families emigrated to Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada and South Africa, all seeking a better life. In the late 1960s, a once-in-a-lifetime sale took place in the auction rooms. A treasure trove of paintings and jewellery that were left inside a pub by Mr Emerson, a fairground owner. I will never forget the look on Jack Robinson's face. If you can remember old Jack, he was quite the old gentleman, nothing fazed him. This did. The look on his face as he looked at the work of arts on the walls, Hogarths, Romney, Stubbs, Dutch Masters, all the top artists. Porcelain, silver, gold, diamonds, sobris and jewellery. Most amazing was the way it was laid out as an art gallery. The sale bought him more than £100,000. In the 1960s, you could buy a semi for £2,000. Like many other properties in this section of Duke Street, numbers 91 to 99 were built around 1860 to 1870. 
Now, Dandy's Furniture Shop, the building has been home to household furnitures throughout its lifetime. Numbers 91 to 93 was first opened as an upholsterer by William Ashburner Jr. in the 1870s and has since been occupied by James Murray, a draper, John Walters, house furnishers, J. Atkinson and Son, furniture dealers and Cavendish Furnitures Limited, with the exception of Simpson's Motor Garage. Many will remember the fire there in 1955, after which four people had to receive hospital treatment. Miss Rose McNichol of Anchor Road, Barrow, rushed up the staircase to bring to safety the books of the company from the office on the first floor and was cut off by the flames. Probably fanned by the inrush of air, the fire spread with amazing rapidity up the wooden staircase to the first floor. It was a significant fire. Fortunately, didn't destroy the building. There is evidence of the fire up in the, one of the lofts near to where the winch room is. Some of the main timbers have just got a little bit of charring in places where this, this fire took place. Well, the, the actual building, I feel, is, is, is a lovely fronted building with the sandstone fascia above the main shop frontage. It's got quite a nice sort of motif on the top, carved in the sandstone. People who live in an area tend to walk past buildings, particularly if it's a shop, because you'll focus on the shop and the shop frontage and what's inside, hopefully, and not look up. And when you look up at buildings, you see a, a beauty in them and a tradition which is is part of our, our ethos really, is to embrace the, the traditions of these buildings. The block of buildings from 111 to 119 Duke Street were built around 1870 and are Grade 2 listed. One of the first occupiers were Walsh and Paul established in 1874 and they traded from both 111 and 113 eventually moving into passing coal when it opened in 1904. This company specialised in the sale of pianos, pianofortes, harmonians as well as other musical instruments. At that time a piano would cost about £20 and could be bought from 10 shillings or 50 pence a month. 113 Duke Street is linked to the famous Sir Malcolm Campbell of Land and Water Speed Records. Sir Malcolm Campbell was a trustee of Legal Life Assurance Society which purchased 113 Duke Street in January 1933 for £600. Malcolm Campbell's final land speed record was over 300 mile an hour in 1935 on Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. Four years later he broke the water speed record on Coniston Water where his son Donald Campbell later tragically lost his life in the boat the Blue Bird. Although 117 is shown above the door, this is actually 115 Duke Street on the main entrance into Forrester's Solicitors. From around 1900 to 1940, James Copland ran a successful hairdressing and perfumery business from the property. The Furnace Toilet Club was a high-class hairdresser and perfumier. Toilet clubs allow patrons to take hot baths or showers as well as providing other grooming services such as hair cutting, toenail clipping, corn removal and moustache curling. In the 19th century houses only had access to cold water so taking a bath was not a regular activity. Every description of ornamental hair work is made upon the premises Natural curly, pin curls, fringes, etc., are made up from ladies' own hair combings at moderate prices. 
From 1952, Robert Twentyman moved in his stockbroker business from 121 Duke Street. After he passed away in 1964, his business partner, Miss Margaret Cohen, took over the business and was one of the first female stockbrokers in the United Kingdom. Margaret retired in 1992, a well-respected businesswoman and a member of the Sir Optimists. She died in December 2006. Her business name was Margaret Ann Cowan. She was only Peggy for friends. Everyone knew her as Miss Cowan. She was quite a formidable lady, uh, but the most incredibly kind person you could ever meet. She qualified sometime in the 1960s. She was something like the sixth lady stockbroker, and she was a fully paid-up member of the stock exchange. She deserved to be remembered because she worked jolly hard all her life um, to become something that's pretty remarkable, particularly for that time. And she was a clever lady. She definitely was a clever lady. Number 117 began life as a tailors and outfitters. The first recorded business was tailor Richard Marsden in 1881, employing eight men and one boy. R. Marsden has much pleasure in informing his patrons and the public that he has now received his stock for the spring and summer trade, and he hereby respectfully invites an inspection of the same. In the tailoring department will be found a most choice selection of black, blue and grey worsted coatings and West of England trouserings, all of which are taking the lead in point of fashion for better wear. When World War I was declared in 1914, a huge influx of workers came to battle and the Salvation Army opened the War Workers Hostel on Duke Street for munition workers. After the end of the war, the hostel remained open and shared the building with several other businesses. By 1939, the building had been converted into a solicitor's, Pickavance and Heron. The practice ran for over 25 years, becoming Pickavance and Forrester for a short time, and finally Forrester's solicitors, who still work from that building today. Just around the corner from Duke Street is Cornwallis Street, named after Admiral Sir William Cornwallis, a celebrated Royal Navy officer. Over the years, numerous businesses and shops have traded here, including a hay, straw and provender supplier, confectioners, hairdressers, draper, tailor, printer, stationers, auctioneers, a restaurant and a building society. In later years, Cornwallis Street was known as a centre for barren nightlife, with bars and nightclubs as the main businesses on the street. The Hotel Imperial was designed in 1875 by architect Thomas Pennett for a wealthy local businessman Thomas Colton Hunter. He saw that a first-class hotel was needed to accommodate the many wealthy prospectors keen to invest in rapidly growing barrow. The initials of Thomas and his eldest son James can still be seen carved in the stonework on either side of the arch above the door. Originally known as Imperial Hotel, the business advertised features to appeal to 19th century visitors, in particular the stables. A much appreciated feature of the house is the stabling, which is on the premises, and affords the best facilities for riding, driving etc, and enables visitors to make excursions to the various points of interest in the district with the greatest convenience. The hotel was also very popular for wedding receptions, parties and functions of all kinds, including the mayoral banquet held in August 1879. The 1911 census records 19 employees, including a housekeeper, bookkeeper, 
barmaids, waitresses, cooks, scullery maids, chambermaids and a busman. In 1944, Furness played host to American army camps. Groups of American Red Cross volunteers toured these camps in mobile canteens known as clubmobiles, handing out free donuts, coffee, cigarettes and chewing gum. The canteen, known as Kansas City, was kept in the Imperial Garage next to the hotel. One volunteer was Elizabeth Richardson, who arrived in Barrow during the summer of 1944 and was billeted in the Imperial Hotel. The hotel is our most comfortable home so far. We each have a room and a small electric heater. The beds are heaven and the bath water hot. In 1945, Elizabeth and the rest of the Kansas City team left Barrow for France. Sadly, Elizabeth never returned home. She died in a plane crash, aged just 27. Oh, they had a garage next door to them, a parking garage. That was one of the areas we'd go in, especially on a rainy day, if the doors had been left open. And we'd, we'd sort of play in there, in amongst the, the guest cars. Sometimes we get chased out. 145 years after opening the Hotel Imperial, it is still welcoming guests to Barrow today who can enjoy the history, the original facade and a pair of beautiful 19th century cast iron lamp standards. These former gas lamps are considered of historical importance and have been given Grade 2 listed status.